gentlemen, here we are with a very special podcast, one that is particularly special for me in that um, I discovered Robert Greene's works in his books, 48 Laws of Power, at a time where I needed it the most. It was an act of serendipity from the heavens uh, for me to receive this book at the time that I did, and it you know, really helped me through some challenging situations and challenging times, and I made a note to myself that I would love to have a conversation with this man at least to thank him and to get into some details of his books. And here we are, not only have we had lunch, but now we're right here on a podcast. So uh, a very special guest to have, Mr. Robert Green. Thank you for coming on the Warrior Poet Project. Thank you so much for having me, Aubrey. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. So I guess like a lot of people, I found you through the 48 Laws of Power. Is that what you seem to find uh, more common than not? It's weird because there was the whole pickup artist community that found me through the art of seduction or people, uh -huh. a lot of people found me through the art of seduction, a few military geeks through, you know, the art of the art of war book that I did. Sure. And then some people through 50 cent, but I would say maybe <laughs> 60, 70% through the 48 laws yeah. like yourself. And I definitely want to get into all of them because I've read all your books. Um, uh -huh. At least in the most part, war I kind of probably about seventy percent just kind of pick and chose some some chapters. But that's one of the things that I love about your books is you don't have to take them as a whole you know pill to swallow all at once. You can kind of pick your right. pick and choose your parts and get a lot out of it in right. almost vignette format. Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of how my mind works. You know, I I, can't, I, I just can't get it together to write a whole book where I want to read everything from chapter to chapter. I like the pick and choose mode. Um, my last book was probably the only book where you almost do want to read it from sure. the beginning to the end, and you can't really do that. But my next one, I'm going to be going back to the 48 Laws of Power model, because that's just how my brain works. Awesome. And the last book he's talking about, of course, for those of you who aren't familiar, is Mastery, which is a master yeah. work indeed, and uh, definitely something I've appreciated. So but let's let's I want to kind of go book through book and, and chat about it a little bit. And, okay. Um, okay. You know, so what I found so interesting was that 48 Laws of Power, it uses so many historical examples that are so unbelievably applicable to today's world. I mean, we were you're talking about vastly different times and kings and courts and emperors and different you know military strategies and all these different examples but then you apply them to regular you know 2008 corporate america 2013 whatever the year and it holds yeah. so incredibly true you know did, so i know i yeah. heard i heard some of uh your ted talk and you mentioned that you kind of started to understand that yourself from all the very jobs that that you had worked where you'd encountered these common themes Yes, um, I've had like many, many different kinds of jobs from very kind of blue collar construction work to working in Hollywood as a writer, et cetera. And I'd seen all sorts of power games being played, some very manipulative, nasty stuff. And I'm constantly reading, you know, books, particular periods fascinate me, like the Renaissance mm -hmm. um, or Machiavelli or Louis XIV. And, and it's, everything seems sort of timeless to me, you know, like the same things I'm reading about are going on. I remember as you were talking, I was reminded uh, there's a story in the 48 Laws of Power about this great Chinese strategist from 2,000 years ago, more or less, named Chuko Liang. Mm -hmm. And he had this... Um, you know, you couldn't think of two different worlds than that in our world now. But he had this one story that I relate in the 48 Laws of Power where he was so clever. You, you always knew that this guy was up to something. He was thinking two or three moves ahead of everybody else. That just the fact that you had to go to war with Chuko Liang struck terror in you because you could <laughs> never predict what he would do. And one time he finds himself completely trapped. He blew it. There's no way out. He only has like 30 men with him. He's stuck in this castle and a giant army is coming to go destroy him. There's no trick in the world that's possibly going to save his hide this time. So he decides he's going to do one, his ultimate trick. He's going to sit on top of the castle meditating 
And when the approaching army comes, they're going to see him by himself sitting on top of the castle. And they're going to assume that this man is so clever <laughs> that he has some trick up his sleeve. And they're not going to dare attack him. And they do, it's what works. And they go and they, they turn around and they leave with their 40,000 men against 30. And I swear I have witnessed this this kind of thing from very clever people before. I've seen it in sports. I know when you're when you're going up against Bill, a Bill Belichick coach team, mm -hmm. you're already worried about how he's outfought you. Sure. It's not the fact that it's ancient China or modern America. It's the psychology, the mind game that's going on that's timeless that was going on two, three, four thousand 4,000 years ago. And that's how my mind works and how the 48 Laws of Power operates. Yeah. That's a that's one of my favorite stories in the in the work, and there's so many that yeah. that illustrate yeah. points that that make sense. I remember there was another Chinese advisor who, you know, or this was maybe just in general that, you know, the emperor you couldn't really tell the emperor that he was doing something wrong, so you had to generate these reports right. of weird aberrant natural phenomenon like the geese were flying backwards right. and all of these things that happened to just let the emperor know that he was a little off course. And I've been in situations, you know, I had a marketing company for many years and encountered many different bosses, basically, at that point. And there was so many that you had to use these really interesting strategies. Like, I think one of the ones was, you know, when you're building an architectural structure and, I, and you might be able to tell the story better or amaze, you leave one thing that's clearly fucked up. And that way, the emperor, whoever you're trying to please and say, oh, Right. That thing is really messed up. You got to change that, but they'll accept the rest of your plans. And I had to use that strategy right. constantly. I mean, constantly, you'd have to say, <laughs> just leave something blatantly wrong, like some horrible color in there, so that they could go, oh, that color, that's terrible. You're like, you're right. I didn't even think that's of a, that. It's the story of Louis Fourteenth and the architect, a very clever architect named Mansard. And Louis the Fourteenth was just such a know-it-all uh, <laughs> that you had to do that to make him like he was actually the one doing the major design decisions. But the point of your story and the stories that I, you're illustrating or that I, you're bringing up is that the people above you, your boss, um, have insecurities. They have an ego, mm -hmm. and so many of the mistakes that people make uh, in power um, is that they don't think that. They think, well, that person is so powerful and strong that I can say, I can criticize them, I can do whatever. But no, they're actually more insecure than you think. Being in that position makes them very vulnerable. And you have to constantly think of what you're doing that might upset them, that might trample on their ego, that might make you look better than they are, for right. instance, and tailor your actions. In the past, doing that kind of thing, like outshining the master, you would have been put in prison or beheaded. <laughs> right. Now you'll be fired and nobody will tell you why. That's what a lot of the laws of power deal with, and that's sort of a timeless phenomenon. It could be a king or it could be your boss. It's all the same. That was, And that was it, really. So I had gotten fired. I did a great job one time for a, for a client and put my whole heart into it, and I got fired. I got fired like right at the point where everybody was saying, Oh, Aubrey, you did such a good job. It was amazing. Well, and everybody was singing my praises. And then I got fired at that point. And I was devastated, devastated. And that was the point where I discovered your book and started reading. I was like, aha, this all makes sense. Right from chapter one, never outshine the master. And, you know, while it was still, you know, just by reading it, you don't get it instantly. At least gave me this framework to say, okay, I'm going to take my emotions aside, take my own pride and my own ego and, you know, feeling yeah. like I should have gotten praised and just say, what's the game? What's the, what, are, what's, what do I want out of this in the end? And how do I survive? And how do I stay afloat? That made a huge difference. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. That's, what, that's sort of the difference between people who kind of succeed in life and don't. It happens to everyone. I've, I've outshone the master. I've been fired. I've dealt with these problems personally. And mm -hmm. every single human being, I don't care how strong or powerful you are, reacts emotionally in the moment. Like, what the hell did I do wrong? Why are they firing me? You can't help it. But the dividing line between people who move past and then get successful is they take a step back and they reflect on it and they see perhaps what they did that might have triggered somebody's insecurity. They go through a rational process of trying to understand what happened so that they don't repeat the mistakes 
And that's basically what the 48 Laws of Power is trying to help you to enter that kind of psychological process where you review your own actions from a bit of distance. Mm -hmm. Now, one question I have that has just actually occurred to me is it was so frequent that you would encounter these bosses and these figures at the heads of large enterprises, corporations that had, you know, pretty substantial egos to overcome. And these power games were very necessary. Why do you think that is so prevalent? Because it would seem you would want to think in, the, in a perfect egalitarian world, the, the best person rises to the top and you wouldn't have to worry about this so much. But historically and in the present day, that's, that's not always the case. What do you think is going on there with that dynamic? Well, it, it, everything depends on the particular business you're in. Um, first of all, we know that it's not a meritocracy and that the best people don't rise to the top. In fact, usually it's pretty, pretty much the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, Especially politics. <laughs> politics, but God, in business. Yeah. Man, my goodness, I can give you lots of examples of that. Um, and so the person who, who occupies that position oftentimes isn't the one who deserves it the most. So they, they're going to have... They're going to have a lot of insecurities. It's a very lonely position. Um, there's not, you know, I work as a consultant to very, a lot of, some people are very powerful and they have nobody they can turn to. I'm mm -hmm. often shocked that this person who's a very uh, important in business or in academia, that why they're calling me, you know, they could, they could just read a book or, or <laughs> whatever. They have nobody they can talk to, nobody they can relate to. They're very insecure. They're very vulnerable. The business world is extremely competitive. If you're a CEO of a publicly traded company, every single one of your moves is being monitored. You don't have a long life. You're aiming for short-term results but still trying to have a long-term view of things. It's, to be a leader in the world today is almost an impossible job because you have to be tough and hard because it's more competitive than it's ever been in this globalized world, but you have to appear to be virtuous and democratic and loving and in favor of all the most progressive issues. <laughs> you have to juggle things that can't be juggled. Mm -hmm. So you're naturally having insecurities. You're having to play games all the time. It's a very vulnerable position. I have many more people who have these problems and who play games on the upper, upper echelons than those in mid-level positions where you don't, you're not, it, it's quite, you're not quite so vulnerable. Yeah, I, I can see where that, where that makes some sense. You know, I think, <clears throat> I think all of these different books, I, I think with seduction and power, you know, there's the counter argument that says, you know, I think there's actually a quote by, uh, by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who says, a warrior's decency is the absence of strategy. And so there's this idea that, hey, if you just play it straight, it's all going to work out, you know, or in, in seduction, hey, if it's meant to be, you know, it will. And really, that's kind of bullshit. You know, there are certain situations where you can just be totally straightforward. And I've striven to do that with my company, but I wouldn't have been able to navigate through all of the dangers that exist if I hadn't had at least a defensive knowledge of the other games that other people were trying to play. You know, it's like you have to have that balance of when to let it all go, but at least have the armaments to be able to fight in this world. Yeah. And I'm trying to say there's no opting out. So the gentleman who said that there's the best strategy is really to have no strategy. Well, that is a strategy, <laughs> right? You tell me what isn't a strategy. <laughs> If you're involved in anything where there are winners or losers, which politics, business, even the arts, anywhere, um, trying to opt out is a strategy. And it's either you're conscious and aware of it or you're not. But there's no such thing as no strategy. <laughs> right. And we humans do because we don't like the feeling of being powerless or having no control over a situation has a strategy strategic orientation. And then, you know, I go back to the quote of Machiavelli. I mean, that would be great if everybody in the world was good. If mm -hmm. everybody in the world was good and decent, then fine. You don't need the 48 laws of power and you can be open and honest. But that 5% of assholes out there, <laughs> they're pretty strong. They're pretty aggressive. Yeah. They can ruin the whole, they can ruin it for 95% of the world. That one person, yeah, and I can sure. on that, call it infection. 
you've got to be aware. You've got to have some defensive knowledge, like as you mentioned. You can't be naive. Um, you know, I have a law in the 48 Laws of Power, which is pretty, seems pretty nasty at face value, which is get other people to do the work but always take the credit. <laughs> and really what it is, it's about making you aware of the fact that that's going to happen to you. Sure. As you're rising to the top, someone's going to make you do all the hard work and they're going to put their name on it. Now, how do you handle that? Are you going to get all whiny and upset and complain and get fired? Or are you going to be a man or a woman or whatever you are? <laughs> That's just the way of the world. I'm going to learn. It's a process. And someday I'm probably going to be doing that to somebody else when they're working for me. So a lot of what the book is about is defensive knowledge. So you're not so damn naive when you enter the world. One of the things I loved when I read it is that you made a choice not to add morality into the book. You took it as a pure exercise in how to achieve power, and that allows the reader to adjust the morality to their own standards. I mean, I think that was a really brilliant move because I think a lot of authors would have shied away from, you know, talking about these techniques that were completely ruthless, you know, involved killing of people or whatever, but very effective. Um, they would have shied away because of the moral issues. But you just said, look, this was a way that was successful in getting power. This is a way that's not successful. And then you apply your own morality. That was a great choice. Did you, did you know you were going to do that from the start, or did that kind of come about? Well, yeah, I mean, I get kind of fed up with all of the, the bullshit out there, like with the book that try to pretend, or the people that try to pretend that you know we humans are all cooperative and that basically we're good and... <laughs> You know, books on how to manage people, et cetera, they just seemed not the reality that I dealt with in Hollywood, in journalism, and all the different realms where things can be, where there's a lot of people playing a lot of very weird games. And so, um, as you say, a lot of people will write about that hard stuff in, in politics or whatever, but then they'll have a chapter at the end in which they apologize for everything and they right. say, you shouldn't do any of this just trying to show you and I just that, that's where I'm different I don't apologize I don't have a chapter at the end disclaiming it all um, as you said I think of the reader as an adult um, you can make your own choice your morality will probably come from your parents and from your own adolescence etc a book isn't going to change you morally this is a book about being aware of what other people might be up to, and you bring to it your own background, and I'll leave it up to you. I will say some chapters are ironic, and you should be able to grasp that, like <laughs> play on people's need to believe to create a cult-like following, and I show you how to create a cult in five steps. Yeah. You know, you can see that I'm being ironic, and I'm sort of showing you how to be aware of how other people can be manipulating you. Shit, I was already four steps deep, Robert. <laughs> you're telling me you're ironic? Oh, oh you mean you've already created Oh, one. damn it. I was already I was already on the path. You can't you can't pull the rug out from me at this point. It's too well, no, late now, Robert. You can use it to create a cult. <laughs> and I'm fine with that, you know. <laughs> but the the examples are clearly somewhat comic. Yeah, you sure. Know? doctors who who make you worship the moon as if the moon is going to tell you, you know, th these kinds of stories from the 18th century. So there's clearly an element of irony, but most of the book, as you point out, is treating you like an adult and saying, these are the weapons, now you know what they are, you can use them or you can, be, you can defend yourself against them, it's up to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, you know, that equal misperception is, you know, to transition over to the artist seduction book. Um, <clears throat> you know, you hear so many times people who aren't very successful in their dating life, in their romantic life, like I wasn't, I was not very successful until I was about 22. And it's not because the girls who I was going after would not have, if we had got past that barrier, it wouldn't have been a good relationship. You know, I, I feel like I very confident that I would have brought a lot to the table. And Mm -hmm. you know, but there were certain barriers in place that prevented these initial steps from happening. The seduction failed at the outset. And when I think people don't realize, they think, oh, if it was meant to be, it would just be. We would just see each other and the attraction would be universal. Bullshit. That's not how it works. There's going to be walls. And you have to get past those walls before either of you are even going to see what each other are about and to know whether you are compatible or not. Well, just think of it this way. Um 
if you're straight, like I am, you know, men and women are all very different. And there's biological reasons for that and other reasons. But, you know, a man will generally be interested in sex a lot sooner than the woman is because she has a lot more at stake in, in that. Um, so you're dealing with a resistance factor mm -hmm. that woman doesn't want to feel like this is something that's just about you getting your biological needs met with someone of the opposite sex. They want to feel that there's something more involved. We can discuss whether that's biological or cultural. It's an interesting question, but it's there. So because the, the, the woman that you're trying to seduce is already very different, has a, very, has a different value system, different things that she wants that aren't the same that you want, by simply being who you are, you're not going to get anywhere because you're going to hit where she's saying he's after something that I don't want to give. There has mm -hmm. to be an element of trust. I have to figure out, you know. So at that point, you have to bring some effort into it. You have to say she wants in attention that's individualized. That's the most critical element in the art of seduction. The feeling that someone is giving you attention that's geared to who you are. You're a different person. They understand your likes. They know that you like to read these books, that you like these colors, that you like this kind of music. Mm -hmm. Their attention is focused on you as a person. Suddenly, that resistance that was there biologically, culturally, starts to fritter away as they start seeing that there's something going on where you're making an effort, where you're honing in on what makes them special and different. And then the seduction game starts to take place. But if you start from the assumption that it's just magic and who you are and the two things will align, you're going against biology, culture, everything, millions of years of evolution. It ain't going to work because <laughs> how human beings work. So. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can tell you from my example, you know, and even the idea that you're going to be exactly your true self when you're talking to that person, that's bullshit too. You're going to either you're going to be some version. You're always going to be putting on some kind of face when you first sure. meet somebody. Even if it's another guy, another friend, you know, it's rare that you're going to be your truest self, you know, in that introduction phase because you're kind of feeling each other out. And my introduction phase and kind of wooing phase for for girls when I was younger, I would be way overly nice, you know, smiles ear to ear on stuff that wasn't, you know, funny and, and you know, just too complimentary, too doting. And it wasn't exciting or interesting for anybody. And But that wasn't really me. That wasn't how I was with the rest of my friends or anybody else. That was me thinking, oh, I want this. This is how I should be. And it failed miserably time and time again. Yeah, people use that, why can't I just be me type thing as an excuse because they don't go through the effort or they're insecure and, you know, that's basically it. It's, it's a crutch to fall upon. The fact that you um, dress a certain way or take some, you ask her on a date to go to a restaurant that you normally don't go to, you're already making an effort. You're already not being necessarily who you are. I always ask the question, who are you? Do you really? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Day you're wearing five different masks. Who you are with your boss, your mother, your sister, you're always playing different roles. That's what it means to be a social creature. So you don't really know who you are, and you have there. You, there are areas you can go that explore about your character that you haven't even realized yet. So don't give me this this weak ass thing. So if you don't know who you are, you have right. things to do that you're not even aware of. You know, and so seduction and and the relation between the sexes is theater. It's a theater. It's a role you're playing. You're creating drama. It should be exciting. It's like a movie. Um, and there's nothing wrong about it. There's nothing nasty or manipulative about it. It's exciting. That's what the mating ritual is like. That's what animals go through when they do particular dances in front of each other. Mm -hmm. So race that sort of illusion aspect of it because that's what makes it beautiful. Your day-to-day -day life is boring as hell. You <laughs> you have to be really boring. But seduction is an area where it doesn't have to be boring, where you can have drama that you interject, surprises, gifts, and as you point out, think not um not meanness, but where you're not nice, where you you deliberately project coldness or you know that kind of element spices up the whole seduction process so 
people who think everything should be just natural and who you are, they're, they're the worst people when it comes to romantic relationships. Yeah. So this was 12 years ago. This was before I knew anything about any kind of art of seduction or anything like this. And I started to learn for myself when I realized that the girls that I didn't really pursue and didn't really like, I wasn't really targeting. I was very natural with them and very open. And they were falling madly in love with me, these girls. Yeah. And then the girls I was pursuing, I did, wouldn't matter who they were. I couldn't push them far enough away. It was impossible for me. And I remember realizing, I just looked and analyzed and said, okay, here are these case examples on one side. Incredible success. Here are these cases. And these girls are not necessarily any better than these girls. It's not like an intrinsic difference in the samples. It's just how I'm acting. And then I started to figure out. And then, of course, I get to read a book like Art of Seduction. And I was like, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> now I see exactly how, you know, how it was going down. But it's, it's such a vital book. You know, I often think we read so much nonsense in schools and in preparation. I mean, 48 Laws of Power is one of the most valuable tools to prepare you for work. And Art of Seduction is incredibly valuable to prepare you for dating. And yeah. Nobody gets those unless, like, your buddy tells you or you listen to a podcast. It's, it's maddening to me. Well, we shouldn't be handing them out to high school. Uh, <laughs> I think we should, Robert. <laughs> I think level the playing field. Then it gets really interesting. Well, I've always had the marketing opinion that the, the fact that you hear about it word of mouth kind of adds an element, a cult-like element that I play on and I'm kind of happy with because – it makes you want to go out and get it. If you're given the book, you have a different relationship to it. Mm -hmm. I like it that people hear about it, someone says it, and then you go do it, as opposed to me telling President Obama to send it out to <laughs> America. <you know? laughs> so, um, but I mean, the, the thing that um, I try to do in The Art of Seduction that's maybe different from the other books is I try to say that there's two sides to the game, which in most books or people, they're, they're always emphasizing one or the other, which is you have to be natural. You can't be this cold person who's read a book, who's applying step one, two, or three. The other person will see through it. There's nothing seductive about it. It looks like what it is. Mechanical. So yeah. who's read a book and who's trying to do a formula. You have to be natural and in the moment. But... So that's the first half of the book. But there's a part of you, I want to make you aware of what's naturally seductive in you. Everybody has a quality um, that is naturally seductive. You're just not using it. You're not conscious of it. So I'm going to make you conscious of what you have, whether it's the fact that you're kind of childlike or whether you have this sort of charming social ability or whether you're sort of the clothes that you wear kind of excite people, the, the dandy. You have it in you. I'm going to make you more aware of it so you can actually amplify that natural seductive quality. And then I'm going to give you strategies. So it's not just being naturally a, a dandy or whatever the character is because that's not enough. You also have to be aware of the things that you do. Putting those two together and, and emphasizing them both equally will make you a really, really good seducer. So that's sort of what I try to do in the book that would separate it from other books. Sure. And then, you know, the, the payoff is there will come a point where, you know, you guys will have, you know, presumably or not, you know, some kind of deeper bond where you could just go back to shitting with the door open and, and doing whatever and having any kind of relationship where you don't even have to think about the book anymore. But there's that initial phase where that those right. strategies you just have to cross that threshold, you know, in order to get anywhere. I had this guy who who um, came to me for advice. Uh, he had this woman that he was just madly in love with. He tried to seduce her, and he made some mistakes, and she just wouldn't return any of his calls. It was finished. And I said, "All right, I'm going to help you get her back." And we worked on it for about four months, email, you know, through email. Mm -hmm. It worked, and he got her back, and then he got he proposed, and they're getting married. And I said, "Look, take the art of seduction and go bury it in your backyard. <laughs> Dig a hole, put it in the hole, or say something, whatever." You <laughs> there, and he did it, and that was fine because he doesn't. I don't. I didn't want him to be using the book anymore because yeah. he was doing quite right, and that's what messed him up in the first place. Yeah. So, got it. Just throw the book away, and I'm happy. Yeah, that's awesome. So as far as the as far as the strategies of war book now, yeah. 
that's very interesting from a historical standpoint. And that's another reason I like so many of your books is there's great illustrations, great stories. I'm a fan of history as well. Um, I was a classics major in one of my what? double majors. And I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I was classics and philosophy was my double major at University of Richmond. You know, that's my major. Really? Yeah. I just oh. I just loved it. It was fascinating to me from the start. And I had a minor in Latin, so I was translating a lot of Latin texts. And so I like reading these type of things, but the application um I wasn't able to get into as much. So what do you feel like is the is the the proper modern application for that book, uh The Strategies of War? Well, it's a, it's a, I think it has wide, thank you, thank yeah. you. I thought I'd show the fans. Very wide application. Um, the first part of the book is showing you, the first four chapters, the mental aspect of strategy. So as we said earlier, I believe that almost everything involves strategizing. Of course, being with your parents or your loved one, there's, there are moments in life that there shouldn't be strategy. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of times, we are strategizing. And even if we're a parent and we have a child who's trouble, who's giving us trouble, there's strategy involved in that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I want to show you the mental aspect of strategy, how you're, how you're constantly messing yourself up mentally. You're getting in your own way by these really bad attitudes. Like, you know, there's a classic military idea of, don't fight the last war, you know. Um, you're always mired in the past, what worked in the past, what mm -hmm. in the past. And I want to say that to be a great strategist in life, in any area, you have to be in the moment. You have to be alive to what's happening in front of your eyes, what makes this particular circumstance different from any other. That's what makes a Napoleon a Napoleon. You're not just simply applying what worked yesterday or two weeks ago or assuming that this person is exactly like who you thought they were a month ago. Everything is fluid, changing. You're in the moment. So the first part of the book is, is very applicable to all life situations. That how do you prepare your mind for conflict? Conflict is a very hard thing for human beings. We don't like it. That's why we have so many passive-aggressive people in the world. Sure. People don't like to confront somebody directly. They don't like to deal with conflict. And so you go through all these avoidance strategies that mess you up. I'm going to show you how to prepare for it without becoming aggressive or an asshole and how to you know, not be afraid of it and how to handle it in a rational manner. It's, this is a book about rational strategizing. It's not a book about crushing people or the dirty, violent part of warfare. It's the eminently rational part. And then, you know, there's chapters about um, how to organize people together. So it's very applicable to those in business who have to run a company with 10 people or 20 people. How do you motivate them? How do you create an esprit de corps? How do you get mm -hmm. people age and then you know on and on i go through chapters on i have a chapter on passive aggression how you deal with people who are passive aggressive because it is a military tactic as well um so the book on the lowest level is going to help you deal with the concept of res people who are resistant or or sure. then the applications get wider business situations that get more and more complex or any kind of uh, work related thing where you're dealing with more and more people and it gets complicated. That's what really this is, this is about. You know, I, I think for me, one of the, one of the challenges I, I really like when I have a defined opponent, you know, that's, that's exciting for me because then I can bring, it's almost energizing in that you have a, an enemy that you can try to use all your forces and capability. And I think I think the absence of that is, um, it's actually, a, it's a motivational challenge. You know, it's always great to have that person doubting you or the person who you're, you know, going against. And, and that's, that's one issue. But as, as you're talking about it, I'm seeing how there's broader applications for this, even if you don't have necessarily an opponent. Because I think in my mind, I was thinking, man, I'd love to get into this book, but who's my enemy? You know, <laughs> who am I waging war against other than myself, you know, and I don't need these strategies to wage war against the parasite of my own mind, you know, that requires different strategies than this. Well, it's, it's, you know, why do people turn to the art of war? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that book is by Sun Tzu. <coughs> that book has been wildly popular for decades now, particularly people in the business 
and you read The Art of War, it's a fantastic book, and I draw upon it heavily for this one. This is sort of my version of The Art of War. But when you read it, it's very abstract. It's yeah. hard, hard quite to, to know exactly how you're going to apply it in your life. It seems so profound, and it is profound, but you don't know what to do with it. Well, I want to take that art of war and the concept and why people are attracted to it you're not people who were drawn to the art of war and a lot of people in the hip-hop world in the 90s that was like their bible they're not drawn to it because they have enemies they know that life is war mm. that life is constant conflict there's constantly battles going on the battles are maybe with yourself and that's what the first part of the book is about but you're having battles with your partner your wife your husband your children your colleagues, your boss, and it can drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. You get emotional, you overreact, you're constantly thinking about that last battle that didn't go. So it, you don't have to have enemies in life for this book to work for, for you. You know, the, In fact, you do have enemies, and they're everywhere. <laughs> right. Um, so... How do you uh, think? How do you think it would apply to you know like Freddie? I read some of your interviews from Mastery. I read the Freddie Roach one. How do you think it would apply to combatants in combat sports? Because my company works with a lot of MMA fighters. I know you have some ties in with some box, some of the boxing community. It does it work on that very literal sense of if you're preparing for a single opponent in athletic combat? Oh, most most definitely. Um, it depends on your style, but if you take MMA or you take boxing, I have a, a chapter in, in the war book. I forget the exact title. It's about forcing the, the momentum. Uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. right? about the offense going on the um, Rommel, his whole strategy in North Africa. You're determining the. Did you find it? Um, no. I, what was it? What was? What do you think it's called? It's about controlling the dynamic, forcing things to your control. Side. The so, dynamic, chapter fifteen. People are constantly struggling to control you. The only way to get the upper hand is to make your play for control more intelligent and insidious. Instead of trying to dominate the other side's every move, work to define the nature of the relationship itself. Maneuver to control your opponent's minds, pushing their emotional buttons and compelling them to make mistakes. I like Freddie that. Roach is a master of that. He's yeah. You're a defensive-oriented person or an offensive-oriented person. And this is, book has two sections. The offensive is longer for a good reason. Freddie is an offensive-minded trainer. Um, he believes that you go out there and you set the rhythm. But what Freddie does is he, as the trainer, sets the rhythm before you, the two boxers ever even get into the ring by playing all kinds of wicked mind games. <laughs> he gets the manager of the opponent upset, and he gets the opponent at the weigh-in, does things to the press that he knows are going to get under the guy's skin. So before Manny Pacquiao ever steps into the ring, the other guy's already seething. Um, constantly playing but he always wants to set the tone i think the most successful coaches um generally do that like i've noticed you know bill belichick will do that mm -hmm. phil Jackson in his own way was like that um so it's definitely going to apply that's the most obvious application of the 33 strategy phil jackson actually you, you mentioned that I, I know another hall of fame you know nba coach and he would always say that you know they were they were competitive and Phil they would see each other and while you know normally most people in that kind of community would be very friendly oh hey how are you Phil would always just kind of glance and give him this dismissive nod you know it's just this subtle mind game of you know yeah we should shake hands as you know hey we're eating dinner at a restaurant together and we're, there's no game at stake but he always was playing that subtle game you yeah. know. Yeah, people who read the, his book, I highly recommend it, Eleven Rings. It came out recently. It's a great book. Uh, people have this misconception of him as this, sort of this new age, touchy-feely guy. But no, he's a master manipulator, and he definitely go, fits into that rubric of offensive-type warfare. But then the strategies get more subtle that you could use, like a, a counterattack strategy. Um, I used to play uh, backgammon every day when I lived in Greece. I was, a, I was 21 years old. And I would play against this guy. Backgammon, if you know, is a game of a good amount of luck because there's dice. This guy, this Greek guy, would beat 
every single time, no matter what I rolled, because he always played the counterattack. I <laughs> destroyed his counterattack strategy, which means you lay back, you let the other person get ahead, you let them expose themselves, expose their weakness, and at the moment that they're not aware, you go on the counterattack. And in soccer, if you ever follow soccer, there are teams that are absolutely brilliant at the counter sure. the whole strategy. Yeah, all of these Muhammad things. Muhammad Ali's rope dope That's a classic example. That's a perfect example of it. Yeah. So you could fit a lot of these strategies into sports, I mean, very, very easily. And I use as you know, I used Muhammad Ali and I've used sports in the book itself. Yeah, right on. So then how did you get linked up with 50 Cent for the 50th Law? How did that happen? My first book, The 48 Lost Power, was huge in hip hop. Um, I remember going back, I think it was 01, that I saw an interview with um, Jay Z, the first hip hop person that I saw quoting it. He actually quoted it in an interview. And then, you know, I'm hearing about a lot of rappers really into the book. And 50 was hugely into it. Um, he told me he discovered the book around 2001. Um, and, you know, he obviously, coming from the streets, understood uh, power games pretty well. You know, he's a hustler. He's seen things a lot worse than I've ever seen. Sure. I think he said nothing prepared himself for the music industry. <laughs> that 80 times rougher than anything he saw on the streets of Queens. Because there, on the streets of Queens, you pretty much knew who was on your side, who wasn't. But the music industry, you had no idea. And people were knifing you in the back, left, right, and center. You never knew who was who. And he said the 48 Laws of Power really helped him. And he really loved the book. So he initiated the contact with me. Um, we met. And it was just a few sisters to meet, really. Mm -hmm. And we saw we had a really good rapport. Um, you know, we come from these two obviously very different worlds, but we connect on the level of strategy. We like to look at events in life from a strategic point of view. So at the time, he was going through this big beef with game, game, uh, mm -hmm. and he was talking to me about the parameters and what I would do and what he was doing, and we just got really excited talking about it. So at that point, I left the meeting, and I thought maybe it could be really interesting to do a book together because we tossed that idea out. Um, bringing our two minds together. And essentially what I would do is, I kind of saw him as a Napoleon Bonaparte type. This guy's very fluid, very strategic, yet can be quite strong and aggressive. And here, I've had to read books about Napoleon. I never met him. I had to imagine him. But now I've got a real life person in front of me. Instead of books, I could study Napoleon Bonaparte in the flesh. So the idea was, I'm going to follow you 50, see what makes you tick, and then I'm going to write a book about, or we're going to write a book about what makes you tick. What's the lesson we could learn? And in doing that, it seemed to me that the core, I have this belief that everybody who's successful, there's something at the core that makes them different and powerful. And I could use 50 to one quality, and that was his fearlessness. He didn't, he wasn't afraid on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. So sort of the book that we decided to write is a meditation on 10 times of 10 types of fear and how you can overcome them. The that was very apropos because you know I've looked and analyzed my own life and so many things that you think are not fear are really just fear expressing itself in a different way. You know, like for example, stress. You know, yeah. you think of, "Oh, I'm stressed." Well, what is stress? Stress is fear of some outcome that you don't want to happen or some loss of something it's fear at the very core and if to get rid of the stress you have to remove the fear because that's the real cause you can't just attack the stress you know it's like it's not going to cause solve the actual core problem and and so i think in that book you do a really good job talking about all of the different ways that fearlessness can help you succeed so i really enjoyed that and one thing that's sort of counterintuitive but uh, we also talk about and there is people are afraid of success yeah they're afraid of the responsibility that comes from it. So they constantly do things to sabotage themselves. They, they're done a job for two years, and just at the point where they can get to the next level, they quit and go, oh, I don't like this field. I'm going to go into it. They're sabotaging themselves because they know if they go a little bit further, now they have to stick their neck out and perform and show that, that, that their experience has paid off, that, that they can succeed. And there are a lot of people who are afraid 
of the responsibility and the reputation, everything that comes from success, and they're constantly running away from it in life. So I want to show you that that's one element of fear, or we do. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. You know, or, or f- being afraid of being alone mm-hmm. and having to depend on yourself, where other people, you're always wanting, waiting for someone else to get you that perfect job or to help you out or bail you out. No, that's a form of fear. You're afraid of being on your own, which is really a fear of death itself because when you die, you're alone. So here's how to overcome that. So, you know, it's not just a fear of like a lion is fronting in front of me. It's about to that's, eat. Yeah. That's danger. Big distinction between fear and danger. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, th- I think that fear of the fear of death is kind of the, is kind of the master fear. And some of the best philosophies have, you know, really taken that to heart and use that as almost the core of their teaching. I know, you know, the samurai is, that was one of the core teachings for them. To be a samurai is to, you know, basically walk hand in hand with your death, know that it's walking with you at all times. And then the Toltec philosophy, Carlos Castaneda and Ruiz, and, you know, death is your wisest advisor. If it hasn't touched you yet, you know, then, yeah. So, you know, the, a lot of different cultures have realized that, but you have to kind of cross that threshold where you get past that fear of death and yeah. then, then start working on the smaller fears on down the line, which are also very, very important. Well, in this book, chapter 10, which is the last chapter, is the fear of death. I put it at the end. Mm-hmm. And by drawing a lot on that, uh, on what the traditions you just mentioned, as well as the Stoics mm-hmm. who have about how to deal with death itself um, and it's it was great because 50 came this close to dying he, he was shot nine times one of them passing through his mouth very close to, you know you don't get shot in the head usually and survive mm-hmm. so he know he felt death and then we talked about it he felt like he was dying and it was an, it was a really strange moment to actually discuss that with him and so the sense that he came back from that was like wow Nothing else matters in life. I'm on borrowed time now. If I nearly died, every moment's pretty. Nothing seems. Nothing's going to phase me now. Mm-hmm. So that was almost the starting point of the book. You have that kind of power inside you, where at some point I'm going to die. So why do all these other little petty fears matter? Boy, that's a powerful position to be in. Sure. So many of these things we're afraid of are involving just fears of ego loss at certain point. Some aggrandizement that we've created or some story even the fear of success is partly a fear of the story that your ego has created having to change you know if you're the person that's always getting slighted never gets the break you know and you've kind of entrenched that in yourself i'm gonna have some scotch damn the world and you get an opportunity to be successful you got to reverse that whole shtick that your ego has been using to support itself and that's scary you know that's a death of your identity of some sort that's a great point. I don't even know if I covered that. That's really smart. I like that. I mean, and one last fear that that's very people don't realize is the fear of of chaos and uncertainty, where you always are trying to control everything. You can't stand if you're if something's going to happen, you don't know what it's going to be, so you latch on to some quick formula, some easy explanation, or you don't get in a situation because you know you can't control it. No, you've got to have you got to let go of that. And you got to let chaos come into your life, and you got to be able to handle it because the world now is so chaotic that if you're this rigid person who's afraid of losing control over things, you're just going to fall apart. Your arm is just going to crack at some point. So these are that's another kind of fear. But the one you mentioned is is pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, it's all this you know interesting process of just getting information more and more and and realizing. It's funny for me in my own journey, it's been a process of, you know, you get to a point where you're like, oh, yeah, I got it. Good. But then that's just the the summit of another hill where you realize how much more you still really don't know, you know, and Socrates' old wisdom of, you know, being the man who knows he knows nothing is becomes more apropos because you're like, oh, God, there's so much more <laughs> just when you think you figured it all out. Yeah, I'm in that position. and. <laughs> books and I'm always I start the next one I'm always at that point you know mm-hmm. are you at liberty to talk about your your newest project at all or do you know have any themes that you're hinting at we skip mastery but that's okay well I'm uh, skipping mastery intentionally because we're about to be on the Joe Rogan podcast and we're gonna go deep 
into mastery and I'll, I'll cover it briefly before we close up here but well it's a it, I, what I do is um, I take a chapter from mastery mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to resonate pretty well with readers but it also resonated with myself on social intelligence um, on how to deal how to read people how to understand the people you deal with um, on a deeper level than what you think you know them you, you probably don't know very well the people that, that are around you um, and I and I had it in mastery because I the idea was you could be the most technically brilliant person you might you could know your field inside and out but if you can't deal with political problems and people playing games and all these other stuff you have no you can't influence them you're never going to you're going to neutralize all of your talent mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to take it to another level and I found readers were really res it really resonated with them but they always said I wanted more I wanted more information so what I'm doing is I want to create the ultimate book on how to understand people I'm calling it the laws of human nature these are cool. this is makes human beings going back 6,000 years when we started living in cities and civilizations, but really 2 million years ago when we were proto-human uh, and then hunter-gatherers, our nature as, is, was pretty much set in stone. Things have changed. We dress differently. We don't have, they didn't have Facebook back in the Bi days of the Bible, but in the days of the Bible, they had Joseph and his brothers. They threw him into a ditch because they envied him. Well, Facebook, you have all kinds of envy displayed. It's not the same. They're not throwing people into a ditch, but they're doing it through social media. Sure. These, these elements are there, and I'm going to show you what they are and how you can see them in people so that you can be a superior reader and understander, understander of, of those the people that you deal with. Um, I had a whole theme in the mastery of mirror neurons this great new scientific discovery which i think is going to shake the world in the next hundred years they're doing amazing experience experiments based around mirror neurons there's a sense of we have a knowledge of people that's not that's pre-verbal that's that's physically oriented mm -hmm. and they've demonstrated it through experiments we have almost telepathic powers where we experience what another person is doing, if if we if we're watching a football game and and John and um, what's his name, you know, uh, Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, yeah. Brady, we're like almost there, feeling it. It's an incredible power. I'm going to show you how you can use that power in this game of reading people, etc. So that's very I'm giving cool. a very high mountain to climb. You know, Very so. cool. That's awesome. You know, Ben Franklin was kind of one of the heroes of that chapter, if I recall correctly, yeah. from uh, from Mastery. He's the icon of it, and I love it because he he mastered six different fields. Uh, you know, sciences. He was a great writer. He was a great politician. He was an incredible inventor. But at, on top of it all, he was a master of dealing with people. Um, and I tried to show in mastery that being good with people also makes you more intelligent on an intellectual level. It makes you more sensitive. It makes you more fine-tuned to details. Um, and Benjamin Franklin was just the ultimate icon in history. He, by the time he was in his 60s and 70s, he had this understanding of people that was so profound uh, that he could like see right through you in, a, in an instant. He had so many experiences had had dealt so well with politics over so many years that he was on an, he like Da Vinci was on another level when it comes to art. Benjamin Franklin was on another level when it came to people. Yeah, you know, it reminds me <clears throat> one of the one of the tools that's helped me along my quest is I've gone down to Peru and partaken in um, the ayahuasca tradition down there in Peru. And I remember one time I was on a vision pretty deep. I'm in the middle of the jungle off the Madre de Dios and the sounds of the Icaros, some two cups of ayahuasca deep, and I get a vision of flying alongside a condor. And the condor is iconic for, you know, vision and, and sight through the world and wisdom. And the condor looks over to me to the left and says, do you want the secret to seeing? And I said, yes. <laughs> he says, see through everybody else's eyes. Oh. And, and just the way that he said that, I was like, of course, if you can see the the best sight you can have is to use everybody else's eyes without 
you know, your own filter, but actually look through yeah. their eyes. And it's kind of a cliche, you know, walk a mile in their shoes, whatever. But just the way that that knowledge came to me, you know, has always stuck to me. And so in times yeah. like that, just really understanding, don't look at them, look at them, you know, look through them. What is going on through them? What are they seeing? What are they afraid of? What are they, you know, desiring? What is all these things? And you get so much information just from being able to do that exercise. And so, you know, obviously the words point to it and, you know, sometimes you get lucky and a, a psychedelic brew can help teach you some of that as well, I suppose. Yeah, I think, you know, I've done those, as we've talked before, I've done the, you know, psychedelics when I was in college and after mm -hmm. that. I've had experiences like that. It's kind of, um, but is about the fact that if you get to the point where you've been doing something for 10 years, 20 years, um, you have a feel for it. Mm -hmm. You're playing the piano, but you're almost seeing the piano from the eyes of the piano. Now, the piano doesn't have eyes, but you're almost inside the piano. It's inside your head. It's in your body. You and the piano are one. Yeah. I know it's a I'm sounding terrible right now, but <laughs> it's true. And I've had drummers. I, recently, I met this guy in, in London recently who's a drummer for... Shit, my memory's going to hell. I can't remember. <laughs> A really great band from I think My Bloody Valentine. Mm -hmm. He's My Bloody Valentine. He's saying I'm, I'm I feel that way. I've been drumming for thirty years. That drum that drum is inside me. We're like one. You know I don't have to feel it in my fingers anymore. Okay, well that's how it is with people. Uh, the model for that is the sense of of knowing people that deeply, where you can almost you're embodied in that. You can feel what they're feeling. Um, so. The mastery that you have in your field, you can also have with people in a social sense. And it's very powerful if you have that, because not only uh, does it make you attuned to individuals, it can also make you attuned to the zeitgeist, to people, to the world at large, to where trends are going, to where things are going, because we are social animals. And that sense of being really connected on a masterful level to what's happening in the world and society will translate into all sorts of creative and other incredible things too sure there's a there's another teaching which you may or may not be familiar with it's of the hawaiian kahuna spiritual tradition and it's called ha pono pono and what it teaches is that if there's something that is upsetting you about another individual what you want to do is go inside your own self and find that part of yourself that expresses that same way and try to forgive and move past that part in yourself and love that part of yourself in order to affect the other person. And it's really pretty powerful because even whatever you're upset about in that other person, if you look deep enough, there's probably that inclination you know, inside your very self. And working on that is oftentimes a lot more powerful and effective than working on you know, somebody else who you have very little control over. Will you send me a link to that? What yeah, you just sure. I'm going to need to know about that. Sure. I'll make really. a note. Yeah. The other thing on that level is uh, the problem in dealing in the social is we get emotional and we react. We're always going, God damn, why did that person do this? Why is that so mean? And I'm, what seems in the book is that generally 98% of the time it's not directed at you personally. It's collateral damage. People are acting out from things that have happened to them in their childhood or somebody else pushing their buttons. So it's not personal. You don't. You shouldn't be taking anything personally. Mm -hmm. Rarely should you take anything personally because generally what people are doing to you is not directed at you. You know, yeah. they kind of imbue you in this philosophy where you can have a little bit of distance from the social. It doesn't mean you're going to be cold. In fact, you're going to end up being a lot more tolerant and actually – you know, more social by by doing this, but a little bit of distance where you're not constantly reacting and taking things personally is sort of a, a philosophy I want to I want to. Absolutely, you know. that's vital. And and also, you know, Don Miguel Ruiz wrote a wrote a great book, The Four Agreements, and that's the very first one. Don't take things personally, and uh, very that, important. Make a note. Okay. <laughs> that might be uh, things that might be relevant to yeah this. yeah i love i love the topic I'm, I'm excited to have it and then of course i'll give you a big mention in the acknowledgements oh, awesome awesome thank you uh so of course we've left a big kind of 
gap in talking about mastery, but we got a great podcast coming up with Joe Rogan here on uh, the 4th of March. So if you're listening to this now, you'll probably be listening to that one anyways, but if you're not, definitely check that out because mastery is, you know, this, that is the book that I think people should teach in schools. I mean, that's the one where I really think every kid should be able to get that and, and take a look and learn, you know, how to be an individual master in their own life. It's just brilliant step-by-step way to get you there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that would be the one in high school that I would agree with, not the art of seduction. <laughs> I, want them to, I want to have everybody learn them all, <laughs> at least in my high school. <laughs> but I have, there are schools that are starting to use it. There have been some interesting like art schools that have been uh, taking the book and using it, uh, and, and there's a business school that's using it. So it is happening, actually. Uh, but I agree with you. That would be the book that would help young people start in their life because – there's no nobody guides you. You 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 leave the university and you get out in the real world. Your parents don't really can't really help you, and they're giving you bad advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody's hel- is helping you, and you get lost and you make mistakes and you never recover from them. And you're 35 and suddenly, whoa! How did I end up in this field? I don't feel connected to it. And half your life's over, and you don't know where to go. So you're 18 to 22. It's really important. It's not going to necessarily give you a, a precise roadmap to where you need to go, but some general sense of direction where your 20s are those most critical ear, years of an apprenticeship, which is what I call it, just thinking in those terms will change it, the whole game for you. So it's, it's, it's pretty important for, for the younger crowd. And, and hell, you know, it's one of the things that I like to impress upon people is it's not too late, even if you're not in your 20s. You know, if you're 35, 40, 45, there's all kinds of amazing stories of people who said, you know what, fuck it. I'm tired of this, this t- ridiculous job I've been doing. I'm going to go follow my passion and my, and my heart. And, and a book like Mastery, you know, I think no matter where you're at, unless you're really, it doesn't matter. Even if you're on the path, it'll help you refine and understand your own path to mastery. And if you're not on it, it's not too late, no matter where you're at. So. That's a good point. I agree with you there. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait to expand this discussion here in another format, and I really appreciate you coming on here. How can people, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you via social media or your blog or anything like that? I haven't been, I haven't been a very conscientious blogger, but I do have a blog. It's um, power seduction and war.com. The and is spelled out. So power seduction and war.com. And there's some blogs from a couple of years ago and then links to all, all the talks I've been giving lately and links to the new book mastery. So that's probably the best way. And you can also email me through that site. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Robert. This has been a pleasure. And one week from now, we will uh, hang out in person out in Southern Cali and do it again. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really happy you're going to be there. That's yeah, great. Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. Have a wonderful week and we'll talk soon. Hey, yeah. Thanks a lot, Aubrey. All take right, care. Take care.